This is Show versus Business, your weekly take on pop culture from two very different perspectives with your host, the real Theo Harvey and Mr. Benja coming with all the relevant info about the week in pop culture. So, Mr. Benja, what are we covering today? What's up, my man? We have got five good stories, as always, even though last week you thought we had four. We actually had five. Listen again. We have, for this week, Beyonce and Taylor Swift. They're making too much money. They're out there doing things, and they're trying to one-up each other. People are calling it the battle of, I don't know, ever. But they're making a lot of money out there in these streets, and we're going to talk about it. Also, we've got race, sex, and sports all wrapped into one with the blind side controversy. You don't know what that's about. NFL fans, you probably know. Everybody else listening, this is good stuff. And our third story, we're going to have Kai Sine, Sanat, Senate, however you want to pronounce it, because I've heard it different ways. Basically, he's the YouTube Twitch influencer that caused the riot, melee, fracas out of New York City that has everybody up in arms. Who is this guy? Just like Pinky Doll and all these others, we're going to follow up and we're going to let you know because this is what's happening. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably don't know what's going on in these internet streets. I'm going to tell you. Soldier Boy, tell them. We also got Amazon and the rush to bio payments. Just, sell, just like they said in cell therapy. Run your hand over the scanner to get your dish now. Yeah, we're about to get in some New World Order stuff. And Amazon doesn't care because they're going to take your money. Also, final story. Is there any hope for the blockchain? Just like any. Yeah, I don't know. The, the biggest crypto heist in history went down. And it went under the radar. Not too many people talked about it. But it's a strange world. And we need to, we, we talked about NFTs and crypto and blockchain in the past. So we want to make sure we follow up on this one being that it's the biggest crypto heist in history. So that's what I got, Theo. How you doing? I'm good, man. I love the storylines. Man, crazy week as always. Mr. Benja. Man, I had a minor celebrity reach out to me, man. Oh. Oh. Big up in these streets, huh? I'm getting up there, man. We've been documenting my journey and my business journey. Get out there more on YouTubes and the Twitters and the twi and all that good stuff. And I uh, had the chance to put out some videos on a great book we talked about on our podcast, 10X is Easier Than 2X. Right, so right. I'm on these streets doing my Doug Dizzle. Then on my LinkedIn page, all of a sudden, something pops up. I say, hey, love what you're doing out there. You mind if I send you and your team some books? I looked and said, who's this? Dr. Benjamin Hardy, the PhD, the writer of... 10X is easier than 2X, reached out to me on LinkedIn. Either he or his people saw some of the content we put out there on, uh, we didn't put, I think we did put something out there on LinkedIn, but because they usually purpose a lot of our content, but he reached out and just said, hey, love what you're doing. Thanks for the shout out. So he reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, yeah, sure. Send it to my business office. So yeah, man. He's yeah trying to make some inroads, man. This is, I think I sent you the screenshot, Mr. Benja. It's like, hey, I guess this social media stuff does work. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when I was first on Twitter, I, I was amazed at the connection you can get with certain people just because no one's made that connection just yet. This happened once at Comic-Con where I saw, what's his name? Miller, uh, the guy who used to do the old SNL, that he used to do the news on Saturday Night Live. Uh, oh, so, Dennis Miller. Dennis Miller. So yeah, I saw him at Comic-Con and I guess his audience the people, he wasn't introduced as anything. He was just standing around. So I stopped and, hey, Mr. Miller, how's it going? And he's like, hey, how's it going? And we just started talking. And it was like, the friction wasn't there because that wasn't his scene. That wasn't his setup. There was no big hoo-ha around him. So it was just like, I could sit down and talk to Dennis Miller for a little while. Same thing on these internet streets. People just show up there and you start talking and they're like, oh, I have that cycles here I can take to talk to this person. Cool, let me do it. Same thing happens on threads, on Twitter. I was talking to DJ Wu Kid, just like, hey, hey, how you doing? And yeah, now you're talking to Dr. Benjamin Hardy. So 10X that, man. I love it. Yeah. I love it, man. Yeah, man. So, yeah. So anyway, and then he also shouted us out on our Instagram page. Yeah. So like I said, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. We're trying to build up a I'm trying to build up the brand there, but it's good to see that people are seeing some of the work we're doing. And I think it's being consistent helps, even though the, the views are not where I want them to be. But I do feel like for my audience and the, the folks that I'm trying to reach, I think it is relevant. So yeah, excited about that, man. That's been pretty good for me. 
What else with you, man? What's been going on with you? Oh, it's been going on with me, all kinds of stuff. But speaking of views, man, I tell people you're good with this. You're good with the consistency and making sure it keeps happening. But I was telling somebody, yeah, it's put stuff out and you're never sure who sees it. I was talking in a discussion and Andy, Chinese pirate, he was like, yeah, so I remember you said this, that, and that. I was like, what are you talking about? Oh, no, you guys were talking about this. And I nodded my head and kept going with the discussion because I knew what he was talking about. I was just trying to connect. Where did he hear this from? Did we have this conversation before? Lo and behold, he had listened to the pod and he knew what I was. He's yeah. So a, a guy in Target I ran into, an old friend of mine, he was like, yeah, you have good conversations on Marvel movies and stuff like that. You know what you're talking about. I'm like, really? Have we ever talked about Marvel movies? I know we talked about Star Wars. I'm just listening to this guy. I, I keep forgetting that this stuff goes out there and people are picking it up. Thank you to all the listeners. If, you, uh, if you're ever out there, just throw a, throw a like, throw a comment or something. We see this. Yeah, you know, where, where you see our, our names and stuff. Yeah, go like Mr. Benja at the Real Theo Harvey. I think also Scott Galloway said this. He said he knows what content they listen to because he has stuff on YouTube. He has stuff as a podcast. Prof G, we talk about him sometimes. He mentioned he knows exactly where that, that person knows him from. If they look at him from a distance and squint, he said, oh, you probably see me on YouTube or on TV. But they walk up to them to, to him and just start a conversation. He said, oh, you listen to my podcast. <laughs> because as we, we talked about this, podcast is so intimate, right? I listen to podcasts all the time. You almost build a relationship, a conversation with this person. And they have no idea, right? You're like, oh, yeah, that this is Uncle G. Grant Cardone. Oh yeah. You walk up to Grant. You say, Hey Grant, I talk to you all the time. What's up? He's like, I don't know you from Adam, but that's fine. That's I've listened to his podcast or his books and all that so often. And then also it's so intimate because you can work out. You like, sometimes I can remember where I heard something based on if I was working out or if I was at the grocery store or trying to pick up my kids. So it's almost like they're like there with you. And so podcasts are very sticky when it comes to, um, audience growth because people just feel like they know you yeah do you have a, a certain routine like when you go work out you listen to these podcasts and when you go to the gym or grocery store you listen to these podcasts you yeah like i used to do that man but i've been more on the youtube now lately so it's like the youtube podcast so but you got your youtube uh, premium right yeah man you got me bro <laughs> I, and i like i guess i started going down the rat hole of youtube university and I just got sick of the ads. It was just like, oh, it's too many damn ads. So I just said, F it. I'm just going to go all in. And then now you can see the guys are getting smart now. They start to insert ads inside the YouTube videos. Yeah. It's just, wait a minute. What is, what I, I didn't pay for this. They're like, in the middle of their talk, they'd be like, so Mr. Benja, but before we get to this, hey, do you like this type of drink? We got it for you. Go check it out. And they're like, wait a minute. This is an ad right now? I'm so thirsty. Yeah. AG1. I know about Athletic Greens and all that just yes. because of podcasts. It's, it's yeah. amazing that there's a whole ecosystem of product. But that's that, the other thing. Yeah. Know, podcasts do the of, same thing. Yeah. Honestly. Podcasts, the audio podcasts do the same thing too, but they've always done that because you can buy, you don't have to buy Spotify, but then there's just so many commercials. Then when you buy a Spotify, you're supposed to get everything with no ads. And then in the middle of the, the conversation, they start running their ad roll. But the secret now is that if you just download the podcast, you probably won't hear any ads because it's all automatic you know, through, through the uh, internet. So I've, I learned that little secret. If I didn't want to hear any ads on Spotify, I just download the, the podcast. And oh, this is nice. Yeah. Very pleasant. I'm just getting all the info with none of the ads. Yeah, exactly. So what about you, Mr. Benjo? What's been going on? So I'm going, I, I'm building something pretty awesome with the creative study lounge. I showed you the prototype and this is, this might be the biggest thing I've done on this level. And I'm really proud of it. And I'm sitting up here looking at my, my 12 week plan, 12, 12 week a year. What's the name of that book? 12 week year. Laying out my 12 week plan. You got 19 more weeks left in the year. By the time you listen to this, yeah, you'll, it'll still be 19 weeks left in the year. 2023 is going to wrap up. So I'm going to do it big. And I, I almost want to apologize for having take this long where it's, okay, can you just do a book? Can you just do a podcast? Can you just do it? And I know you get mad at me like, man, just release it. And I'm like, 
dog, I start building a bicycle and I'm like, wait a minute, this could be a motorcycle. Wait a minute, this could be a hovercraft. And it's good though. It's good. So I'm going to quit tripping. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be rolling out. It'll be rolling out. I've started making payments on this stuff. So now (laughs) it's legit. You got it. Once you start making them payments, man, it's real now. You're like, dang, something's got to happen. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that, that's what's nah, going man, on. Nah, man. Nah, I love it, man. My big thing, just get it out, brother. Get it out, man. That's the key. But you inspired me. I'm looking at membership sites and all kinds of ways to engage my audience. I don't have a direct-to-consumer type product, but I'm trying to see if it works in the B2B space. But uh, there's uh, no business to business. It's a little bit different because you're selling to a business to help them either grow revenue or, or cut costs. But I think there's some, at the end of the day, it's about helping people, right? And so I'm trying to figure out how I can help them more with some lower price offerings um, as opposed to my core offering. So I think uh, that's what I'm thinking about as well. But yeah, you've inspired me as well, Mr. Benjamin. This works, this may be my MO for the future. I think this is, this is the way to go, man. This is the way to go. Holla at me in 2024. I love it. Let's do it. All right. We got story number one. Beyonce versus Taylor Swift. What you going to do? We've got two of the top performers in the world doing their live tours, making big sacks of cash, getting everybody riled up in this new era. Beyonce, a couple years ago, she was just dropping albums and tours without announcing them, and getting people in a frenzy. Taylor Swift has this her whole gang of Swifties that are ready at her shows. They know all the set lists. They know all the songs. It's a big party. It's madness. But Theo, you have personal experience with some of this. And you were going to tell me about it. And we were just like, hey, let's put it on the pod and see what happens. Tell me about your connection with us, some Beyonce action. Yeah, let's put some more context around this. Beyonce and Taylor Swift, man, they have been intertwined together for years, man. It goes back to the whole Kanye West controversy, right? The VMAs, MTV uh, VMAs, where he just stood up and Taylor Swift won Best Artist. Then Kanye came up there and said, nah, man, I'm not, I don't want to be able to interrupt you, but yeah, I'll say that best out of the year. And that pretty much, Taylor Swift pretty much owes her career probably to Beyonce more than she would care to admit because she started out as a country pop singer, right? It was just like, hey, this is her lane. And because of that, she just blew up to this, like this phenomenon, right? Her own, what you made as a pop artist, especially a female artist, when they have a name of your uh, fan, fandom, right? She's at the Swift, you got the Beehive for Beyonce, the Navy for Rihanna. Yeah, so many. So anyway, so she, so they've been intertwined. And so now they got du- dueling tours right now. So to be fair, yes, Taylor Swift has way bigger audience right now. And she's doing things that are just phenomenal. It's brought to my attention. I was watching, uh, reading this article from, so now we're going to get into the more internet and business side of things. Eugene Wee, Ben Thompson, who does writes about a lot about internet and write about business of internet technology. And Eugene Wee used to be at Amazon. He used to run, had a product. He went to film school. He's a blogger out there that talks about technology as well. And he just really nailed it on the head is what Taylor Swift is doing is unheard of because she's basically doing these eras tour and basically selling stuff. She's basically repackaging all her old albums into new versions. So number one, it's the same music, really mm-hmm. just a little different, slight changes. And she's selling out like, instead of going to one city and another city, she'll stay in the city for a week. So she was in Tampa earlier this year. She had a three night engagement. I was downtown in Tampa with my wife and we're, I'm like, where are these little girls, little Caucasian, little white girls out here? <laughs> What's going on? Taylor <laughs> Swift. It was like, seriously, you would thought something was like, is this a Girl Scout convention? What is going on? It was that many out there, man. It was very noticeable. And so she just took over Tampa. And then you probably heard the stories about mayors giving her keys and all this stuff because she'll stay and, and do show up the show. And so she just did a six night show yeah. in LA. All these celebrities came out, did that. So that's the Taylor Swift version. So Beyonce. I actually, I actually heard that brought in $320 million to the city's economy. And that was just like a huge bolstering to the, the coffers, basically. And everybody was cheering that on. So I, I can understand that. Easily, easily. And what's the internet side, business side? He, uh, so Eugene Wee said 
that he thinks the internet er error generally are constantly looking for new sources of scarcity. And it was happening with the whole thing where you actually get a number to get a, a ticket, the ticket master lottery. And so a lot of people didn't get access to Taylor Swift tickets or Beyonce tickets, right? And that created that all great element of any great marketer, FOMO, fear of missing out. So there were people like my sister, who was a Beyonce fan, just got those tickets right away and she didn't care what they cost. And there's other people like, I don't care about no Beyonce. But then they hear people going, they see the fandom on the internet, see people dressing up, doing their thing. And then now that FOMO has developed. So to your point, so switching over to Beyonce, she's doing similar thing. She had a two nights stay in Washington, D.C., three nights in uh, Atlanta. Then she came to Tampa for one night, one night only. And man, you thought people lost their mind. My wife, the FOMO kicked in hard, man. Like when she saw the videos of people going, all oh, my friends are going, what's going on? I, at first, no, let me take a step back. First, Beyonce tickets out there. I, I'm not trying to go no Beyonce, whatever. I can listen to, get information. I can listen on Spotify anytime. But then the FOMO hit when she saw all the Instagram, people at the concert, taking videos and all that. Mm -hmm. That was weeks. And, and then she's like, maybe I need to go. And then she started going to try to talk to people, see what's going. Then it got closer and closer. The day of, man, I really want to go. <laughs> no, don't give in. But yes, man. Internet has drove is driven this more than they would care to admit. Because I think the it's the experience of it that like Eugene we talks about. It's like concerts are one of the few things that it's like an experience. You can only go that one time to see that artist and do their thing. And I've I've been a big proponent of that lately. I think I I, I told on the podcast before, I had the opportunity to go see Prince in Atlanta. And that was mm -hmm. his last show before mm -hmm. he passed away. And ever since then, I've always been like, I got to go see an artist I've never seen before. Like, I yeah. want to see Kanye for my birthday here in Tampa. He canceled it like a punk, but uh, nah. <laughs> no, shout out to Kanye. But he, it was a controversy at the time when he canceled it. Stuff like that. I, I've been the big proponent that of all artists, you just got to have to, if you really enjoy their music, you should go just see them one time. So you said I was there. Yeah. So anyway, make a long story short. Um, I think that FOMO, the internet era, the scarcity of getting the tickets. And then we found out that, guess what? We could get those tickets. We could find on the internet, people are streaming the concert. So we found someone who was streaming it, had their phone up. We could watch the whole concert for about 30, 45 minutes for free because someone was streaming it because they want to share the experience. And that was almost as good as being at the con, relatively speaking. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like the internet has really transformed the whole concert experience. It's, it's enhanced it, created scarcity, FOMO but also inclusive inclusivity because now people can stream their experiences where they at. So I think that was kind of interesting because someone streamed it live. Yes. Instagram. No, that's interesting. And I know what, I know Taylor Swift in particular was doing with the new way she's doing concerts. She's releasing the set list. She's releasing the guests. She's releasing the order that things get played in. So it's more, I don't know if you know how like the Rocky Horror Picture Show goes. But everybody shows up and they know what's going to happen. And even though you know what's going to happen, it's like you're waiting for it. You're anticipating it. So I got to go to the bathroom and come back before she starts into this song. So oh, here comes this other song. Okay, let's all get together, ladies, so we can do our dance together and record it. And it becomes like this big event, even though it's not that spontaneous or not that new and interesting. You've just got a group of people all enjoying in the same experience. And it's like you get to be a part of it. So... There's some uh, interesting things here that, that Taylor Swift is, is doing. It gets innovative. The fact that you're doing the same 45 songs for the most part, it's like, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, that, you're right. That's a good key point from the article as well. You talked about that. Like some uh, live experiences, you don't know what you're going to get, right? It's for you, but you don't know who's going to win. It's exciting. But then some people just, you know what? I just want to be prepared so I know what's happening so I can have my set list. I know what videos I'm going to do with my girlfriends. I know what song I can prepare the lyrics. So when I sing, it looks like I know the words for every song. So it's just, it's really more of a prepared experience. And then you're doing it with thousands, tens of thousands of people. It becomes almost like, man, dare I say it? It's almost like church where you're mm -hmm. in a communal environment. You listen to the pastor and you're like, amen. And you're reading from a scripture that everybody knows what it looks like and what it says. And so, so you become almost one. And if you've ever been to a real spiritual experience, 
It's almost like you're not part of yourself. You're part of something bigger than yourself. And I think that's what people are looking for with these concert experiences. Hmm. Very interesting point, man. I like it. So where did this take us now? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Keep moving or okay, go to the next story. Just in conclusion, look, man, <laughs> concerts are still going big, especially for big artists. Kudos to them. They're doing something interesting by creating more of a communal experience. And the internet is just really blowing these up. So concerts aren't going nowhere anytime soon, in my opinion. All right. And speaking of these big voices and these big names, that's going to take us to story number two. And I'm going to reorder this a little bit because it makes more sense. But Kai Sanat has too much influencer power. And talking about influencers and people doing things, Kai was just a Twitch streamer, but recently he showed up big in the news because basically he caused a riot. In New York's Union Square, he said, hey, I'm going to give out some PS5, $600 video game systems. We're going to hang out. It's going to be crazy. Everybody come out there. And uh, yeah, everybody did come out. Like, everybody. Caused a riot. There were a whole bunch of people out there. It was out of control. There was some fighting. When the police came and tried to break it up, you got all these teen under-18 kids throwing stuff at the police and kicking the squad cars. It got a little rowdy. Nothing major. It's like kids with soda cans and stuff and trash. Not like a riot, but yeah, it was out of control. But this is another moment where you need to stop and realize that these influencers are on another level. And if you're not noticing it, you're missing out on what's actually happening. here. No mainstream. We're jumping on Twitch. We're jumping on Instagram. We're jumping on TikTok. We're jumping on YouTube. We're talking our piece straight to the people. And we're building something crazy and new. And it's out of control. Theo, did you ever expect to hear about somebody giving away PS5s in the in New York and causing a riot? I did not. I didn't know who this guy was until he put, put it in show notes, man. Yeah, this is the new reality. Audiences, fandom is so fragmented now. We just talked about Beyonce and, and Taylor Swift. And a lot of people know them because of prior to the big internet era that we're in social media era, they've been big stars, but now you have people getting millions of views that no one ever heard of. That's almost like watching a TV show, a bit hit TV show and no one knows who those people are, but the inter there's so many different shows out there. And this guy you mentioned to me, he's just the new version of a late night talk show. He's doing skits. He's doing, obviously doing reaction videos. He's got his old core audience he's got his players that show up like his bodyguard you showed me one of his bodyguard that was he was stealing food from so it's just like ongoing bits that you see from tv yeah. shows and other type comedy shows it's just like a new era of not just influencer but personality right tv yeah. personality so it's in interviews too just like a late night talk show this is the new version of that i think he had what's her name ice spice so mm -hmm. he had he was interviewing ice spice and you know what they started doing halfway through the interview? They started having, they started doing a TikTok dance. So they're like, hold on, how do you do that dance? And they just stopped and like actually started doing the little dance. And of course, they're streaming it to TikTok. So every one of his guests, his bodyguard, by the way, that you mentioned earlier, who broke in and stole his food, his bodyguards, his driver, all of them, they run their own streams out of this big house. So they call it the amp house and they do a bunch of filming and recording there. If Kai is on there streaming and he starts eating, you can go watch the other dude stream, the bodyguard stream, and he'll be sitting there like playing video games or something on his Twitch screen. And he'll see Kai eating and he'll like, oh, hold up, what's going on? And he'll actually leave his stream and you'll see him jump in on Kai's stream. It's a phenomenal level of just Hey, wait, what's happening? And you can watch it in the chat. Oh man, I'm over on such and such a stream. He's driving over to Kai's house right now. It's mind blowing the way it's so connected to the people and regular. This is stuff we used to talk about in college and stuff we used to do. And we're wondering if we had a camera on ourselves, like if me and you had a camera on ourselves while we were playing Mario Kart and suddenly some other streamer is on Twitch or their TikTok, like live streaming. Hey, I'm. I heard Theo was trying to play some Mario Kart, get in some practice before we had a 
our tournament this weekend. So I'm, I'm going to go in there and mess with them. It's just this whole weird interconnectedness, and I'm totally fascinated by it. Yeah, me too. I, I do wonder as people, like I said, as the producers and consumers, are we becoming more consumers now because everything is so accessible? So instead of creating your own group of friends where you can share communal experience together like we did in college, right? Now you're like, oh, get hanging with Ben. I'm going to watch a Twitch guy do the exact same thing. Right? Just play video games. Because we used to do that too. I remember coming over to your house or you coming over to mine and we watched someone play video. I saw someone go through all of Resident Evil, the first one, in 30 minutes. And we all yeah. s- stood around the TV and watched it. And then someone knew that was going to be a big thing. And that's how Twitch started because watch people play video games is pretty much Twitch. And the show yeah, yeah. is more than that now. But yeah, so I think all this stuff is, is interesting because it's like we would have done that back in the day, right? If we had video. But then I question, does this next generation even have that ambition to do so? And I, I, in case of point, I'm just thinking about like some of my nieces who are in their Gen Z millennials. There is that lack of somewhat ambition, somewhat that, that go get it this right i think yeah. that's lacking okay. this next generation it's almost like, oh man i gotta get my resume together oh man i gotta go interview uh, oh man i gotta it's, there's no oh yeah where's all oh, i gotta get i gotta get these hundred interviews. i'm gonna go to these conferences i'm gonna yeah. pass out these i do sense that a little bit man. and i'm not saying it's the internet's fault social media's fault but i do feel like there's a big question mark around are they getting their the dopamine hits and their sense of experiences from the influencers as opposed to experiencing themselves. And so that's something this guy, Kai, is people living vicarious, right? They live in their lives through what he's doing. And it's almost like the same as if you're experiencing it, right? And so I yeah. think that's, that could be a concern. Yeah, um, there, there definitely is that. But it's like, I think there's so much more connectedness to the, like we were very far away from an Arsenio Hall or a Jay Leno. We're very far away from it. And the closest we could probably get to that is maybe write a letter or do a cable access show. And that, which took a lot of work in itself. But if you look at man, cable access, boy, back in the day, boy, that was legit stuff, man. That's uh, when you got all the craziness showing up. On. <laughs> shout out to Rev, shout out to Reverend X for anybody that knows. Man, shout out to the local Tampa station that always have the, the local strippers. Oh, 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 man, it was like, what? They put this on basic cable? Like, why <laughs> cable are you, access? yeah, calm. <laughs> but if you have a PS5 or any of the new systems, you can basically stream and share from the system. It's built into it. So while you're sitting there playing, you could like, hey, I want to share this last 30 seconds or whatever to Twitter. And off it goes. And that's how people are making all these clips and things. You just have this instant share that's built into the systems, community gotcha. built into it. We, we talk about streaming a lot, streaming movies and TVs. They've actually been pulling away from the connectivity. But if you look at these game systems, they've really been leaning heavily into it. So I'm playing a game. I get my friends in. Everybody's hanging around and so forth. But it's crazy. And... It's just very interesting. If you're not watching what's happening, this is a, a big shift that's turning us all into these, as Gary Vee calls them, little autonomous connected media companies. So I agree. So, you and I Gary are v. little autonomous, connected, and individual media companies. We try, man. We try in the industry. <laughs> so go check out Show versus Business on YouTube Shorts. Give us a shout out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> On to story number three, the blind side controversy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Stuff is still happening out there in these Hollywood, in these NFL, in these TMZ related streets. And this one, Theo, I'm going to let you take the the reins on it because you're much more connected to this world than I am. What we got? Man, how do you not know about the blind side, man? I was was blindsided. Michael Lewis, right? He was the guy that wrote the big short he's a big time author he takes complex stories and make them into like narrative books that make sense about finance sports business so he wrote uh liar's poker he wrote the big short he's yeah. actually that guy uh, gonna write a book on sam bakeman freed about the ftx debacle so he's been around forever right this guy he used to be an investment banker so he wrote a book in i think it was 2007 called the blind side about 
it was about the evolution of the sport of football and how quarterbacks have become so important in football that um, a role that was basically a non-existent role, uh, which was the left tackle uh, offensive line, has become more and more important. So much so that people start to draft offensive linemen uh, more so than they did running backs or things that's been football that would be more important, you think. But because that 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 blind side protection for the quarterback was so important, because guess what? Most quarterbacks are right-handed. They're looking right-handed. They're not going to see the right. blind side, right? You need somebody big to protect them. If not, quarterback is out, and that's going to mess up your season. So the evolution of this kind of new kind of offensive lineman evolved. And of that, he came up with this interesting story about Michael Orr, who was a young black man who grew up without him. His mother was on drugs. And so it was a nice story about a, a family of the Tuleys who were white, who basically, quote unquote, adopt, adopted him and helped him get through his plight. So he'd become an All-American in college and eventually get drafted by the NFL. So heartwarming story, right? You got sports, you got race, you got all great things. It was so good that they made a movie about it starring Sandra Bullock in 2009, where she won her first Oscar for playing the mother in that role so that was the that's the story right it was a big thing I, i'm surprised you probably heard about it you just forgot about it but it was this big thing and it's also the whole white saver complex but we'll get into that another day so anyway so that was the thing it won oscars big it's a big movie big book all that here we are michael war is retired from the nfl he released the book come to find out that the family did not adopt him they, in essence, had a sense where they put him under what they call conservative, conservative, what that was called, conservatism. Or it was some kind sure. of conservatory, excuse me, where they basically, uh, he's not officially a family member, but they can control his financial dealings and stuff when he was a minor and all that. And because of that, he never partake, partook of any of the financial dealings that came from the movie and the books and all that stuff. Because the family got rich. So let's, let's, get it, let's not get it twisted. The book came out, the movie came out, I think the mom wrote two books based on that fame. And so they made lots of money, the family, Tuli's family. So Michael Orr wrote his own book. Now he's retired from the NFL, say he didn't see any of that money. They didn't officially adopt him and he's bitter. <laughs> and so it was a big thing that popped up on ESPN first and then became, now it was in the Hollywood. There's a variety. It was in, and I think it's an interesting story because it combines a lot of things. When I saw the movie, so let me take a step back, Mr. Pippen. Do you remember this movie, number one? And did you call Cap on the movie when you first saw it? <laughs> or thought about no, it? No, so I, I just looked the movie up, and I see I see the poster of Sandra Bullock and this big football player, and then I see another screenshot of her, like, poking a, a football player in the chest, like, I'm going to tell you what's right and just about the world. And based on that, I remember going, oh, no, I don't want to see that. <laughs> the, the blonde tender yeah. not even the dark yes but, yes but you got it that's exactly the concept and yes it's so for those that don't know there's a period of time where it was better to be race neutral i think they're trying to get us back to that point with some of the folks out there but it was time like hey we can all live in harmony right and there's a lot of the white saver tropes that went out there, right? But Dangerous Minds, the good Hollywood white lady came in and saved the inner city, right? Or there's just so many, right? Just so many. I forgot about tropes Dangerous there. Minds. That, yeah. that was funny. When she pulls up the chair and sits on, sits on her backwards because I'm going to tell you. That's how gangsters sit on chairs. And gangsters respect gangsters. Yeah. Get out of here with <laughs> that, man. That's how gangsters respect gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> they don't talk to you unless you pull the chair backwards. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So that was the concept of the whole movie. But even at the time, I think we just, something smells funny about that, right? And so it's like almost anything you suspect now in the world, you realize, you know what? That, that probably is not legit. It's not true. And that, I think this whole story about Michael Orr and his family is very disheartening because they came in, they said they're going to help him. Now he's, attesting that they they knew he was going to be all american so it was, he's they were saying oh he didn't know anybody he couldn't do anything we, we had to help him all this stuff he said yeah they helped him but he said look he was on his way to be an all-american he didn't need their help like that or i think he was like 
18 or, or 17, about to be 18. So it wasn't like he had nothing going on. He also said that they portrayed him pretty dumb in the movie and that kind of affected his money and his bread in the NFL because they thought he couldn't read playbooks because of the movie. They said it, it did more harm than good. But at the time, he didn't say anything about it because it was doing well for the family and he was just starting his NFL career. He didn't want to make no, no rhyme or reason. So yeah, it's a big old thing. The family, they, they finally admitted that they, and it, it, it does smell a little bit suspicious because if you tell the kid, he didn't know nothing better. He said, oh, we're going to adopt you. I'm sure they probably said something like that, but then they didn't officially adopt you. It doesn't seem like they were genuine in their affection for him. And that's mm-hmm. something I think maybe was hurting him more than anything. I think we need a remake of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to call it. The Wink Side. <laughs> The broke woke. Yeah, the broke woke, man. So anyway, okay. it's, I think the reason why I brought it up is because it does intersect the three things, race, sports, and Hollywood that we that is about America. And everything we thought that was good about that movie, even back then, we always suspected something about it, found out that we were right and that we shouldn't have watched it. And Mr. Benjamin, you did a good job. So congratulations to you. Kudos to you, Mr. Benjamin. You saw that coming. What, hey, 20 man. years ago? <laughs> hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get better at reading uh, posters like Ouija boards, man. You just carefully, s- slowly bring your hand over a poster and you're like, nah, this ain't right. I'm not watching. <laughs> don't, don't mess with that. Don't mess with that witchcraft. <laughs> exactly. All right. Story number four. Amazon is bringing in the new world order with this rush to bio payments along with Google and Apple. And WorldCoin, actually, with Sam Altman, but we'll get to him in a second. Basically, Amazon wants you to pay with your palm. I don't know if you've been following Amazon, but they've been doing this thing where they're trying to get people's payments faster. And, hey, maybe we can just have it on their phone. They just walk through the store and buy whatever they want and not even have to stop at a checkout. Just walk on out. Okay, the go centers. Okay, the one-click buying. They've been on this kick for a little bit. But now it seems they said, hey, you know what? Let's just jump to it. Let's just have you walk past a cashier, run your hand past the scanner, and that's it. No credit card, no, no cash payment, none of that. Just wipe, swipe your hand over the scanner, think you've paid, walk yourself out. Thea, this sounds like it's futuristic halfway in an awesome way and halfway in a scary way. How's this got you feeling? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. <laughs> the cell therapy. <laughs> Shout out to Goody Mob. Y'all go look that song. Shout out to go check it out. But hottest beat intro. One of the hottest beat intros ever. On the old 30 they, piano, by the way. Yes. There was a lot of good stuff they were talking about in that. And look, we talked about religion and all that stuff before. But yeah, there's just, this is a smell right, man. There's a, there's a talk about buying stuff with the palm of your hand. That to me, and look, 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 let's be honest. Look, we had these cell phones. We knew that was coming. When we're starting to do Apple Pay. I'm be honest with you, the pandemic would really got me using more and more Apple Pay. And it's so convenient. And I could easily see that going from this to this, right? And to pay for stuff. And that's when it gets scary when they imprint something on you or some chip or on you. And it's almost like, got them. And, and that to me, now they can control what you eat, what, what you buy. And so it does seem controversial, but I get it. Business going to do business, right? I get it from the business standpoint. It's faster to process payments. It, it's ingrained inside. It's based on a biometric meter or a bio, bio monitor. And so I get that part because it's faster and it's easier mm-hmm. to associate who bought what. And then the more specific you can get on that buyer, right? But with the palm of their hand, then they can market to them way better. I always think back to the minority report, right? Where they knew when you walked in, he had a new set of eyes. They said, hey, Mr. Yakamoto, welcome back. You bought these bl- Levi blue jeans. Would you like a pair of boots to go with that? And so that's the ideal dream for a marketer that you can speak directly to uh, a potential yeah. consumer, but you can do it at scale, right? You can personalize it at scale. And I think that's where biometrics come in as well but yeah nah man i ain't doing that (laughs) That, that, that's just a bridge too far son (laughs) yeah so i'm looking at this report and it says by the end of the year you'll be able to scan your palm this is from the wall street journal by the way 
By the end of the year, you'll be able to scan your palm at any of the company's more than 500 Whole Foods stores in the U.S. and join a service called Amazon One. Once enrolled, your hand is all you'll need to pay there. Amazon Fresh grocery stores, some Panera restaurants, a handful of retailers at airports, some stadiums and concert venues, and a handful of Starbucks locations. Yep, it's this is happening. And Goody Mob, we were talking about them with cell therapy. So basically they had the song way back in the day. And at the time it sounded like conspiracy theory. It sounded like they're a little goofy and they're a little on edge, tinfoil hat wearing jokers. But Big Gip in the last verse says this, has this line. And it's, this whole song is deep, so you got to go listen to it. But he says, to enforce the new system by rain, tag my skin with your computer chip. Run your hand over the scanner to buy your dish. No more fishing for your fish. Kiss the days of the old days way past gone. Mind blown conception. Protection. My name on your selection. But I felt you coming. Pow. <laughs> so basically, he's talking about himself seeing the new world order coming. Yeah, man. Prophetic. And I, I like it. I don't like it, but when I'm in the store, I'm like, man, how about, oh, Apple Pay. Bink. It's just like, it's too Nothing good. Yet. What are we going to do? Yeah. That's the challenge, man. So yeah, so yeah, from a business standpoint, I get it. But from someone who is all about freedom and not having people control things too much. And that was also the big controversy during the pandemic, right? Where people were like, they're going to do this and do that and try to get chips in you and stuff like that. So it's a fine line, right? We don't want to be over here controversial, but at the same time, we want freedom. So I think companies like Amazon and others have to be careful about what they release to the market and, or at least try it out first and they'll just announce things. Yeah. Can you imagine like somebody's hand getting chopped off and just run to the store with and buy now? <laughs> it's like some billionaire's hand. Just, I don't know. But also in, in related news, WorldCoin, Sam Altman has this coin thing that he's offering. Sam Altman, the guy behind ChatGPT, the company there, he's basically launched this coin and you get crypto payments basically by signing up to the service and having your eyeball scanned into this eyeball scanner. So you've all seen this, the spy movies where they put their eye up to the screen and it scans their eyeball. Yeah, there's basically a company that's doing this in real life. And to get sign-ons, they're going to pay you in crypto to have your eyeball scanned. Yes, yeah, weird. Yeah, just think. You sound done. You're just like, man, just, just bring it back to the, the quarter, I just, quarter. I get what these guys are doing, but they just run out of ideas, man. Instead of trying to solve like, real problems like homelessness or um, income inequality, they're just doing more of the same mess that we read about dystopian futures in, in sci-fi. It's like, dude, stop. Just yeah, yeah. use all your energy to, to do something great. Not, I mean, for all Elon Musk problems, you know, which are many, at least he's trying to do something different. He's trying to get us to space or to Mars, or he's trying to think through transportation. Yeah. But I don't see anything, anybody else doing anything that's just as broad like that, like climate change. There's well, yeah, some and, but there's nobody who really could do something about climate yeah. change talking about it. And same thing. Uh, people give uh, Bill Gates a lot of flack um, and he's on the weird side of things, but he's out there doing the clean water thing. It's like, hey, yeah. if I can get clean water to all these places that fundamentally changes everything. The, the conspiracy theories on about population control, but this is clean water is going to save lives. It's just going to make lives better too. And so there's that, but the new world order is something we could always talk about. And I don't want to talk about it too long because that's how you get shut down. Yeah. Keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On to story number five. Is there any hope for the blockchain at all? I ask because the biggest crypto heist in history went down. And of course, like most things, crypto, like most of these stories, it's stupid. Just this husband guy and his rapping wife, who def definitely has no business rapping, have been caught up in this scandal. And when they counted, when they went back and counted the money, started looking at the fund, turns out it was the biggest crypto 
highest in history. Theo, you heard about this? I did not know we tried to talk about it previously, so please give me some more insight. <laughs> All right, reading from Daily Beast. But the so-called hipster crypto couple, when you got a name like that, it's already starting out bad. Ilya Lichtenstein pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit laundering. A federal, federal count carrying up to 20 years in prison. And his wife, an aspiring rapper, Heather Morgan, pleaded guilty to one count of money laundering. The pair were arrested last year on charges related to the 2016 hack of Bitfinex, Hong Kong-based cryptocurrency exchange. Roughly 120,000 Bitcoin had been stolen. I'm going to stop right there. 120,000 Bitcoin had been stolen. And they were only able to cover about 95,000 of the Bitcoin. Hmm. 120,000 Bitcoin were stolen. And they were only able to recover 475 million out of the 3.6 billion. Hmm. Roughly. So there, there's a couple numbers th they're throwing around here. So be sure to go back and check the numbers for yourself. But yeah, in all total, it's a 4.5 billion crypto heist. And it's... Why, why is this still a thing? Like these randoms are just running around getting people's crypto, starting up companies, doing press conferences, throwing out white papers. Suddenly they've got all this money flowing to them. Next thing, can't get your money out. It's the same old story. And it has actually has me wondering, is there anything good that can come out of this whole blockchain crypto NFT thing? And I think so, but I've gotten a lot of pushback and I just want to know what you think. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, I just did the numbers. It's what, $25,000. So yeah, $25,000 for Bitcoin right now. That much Bitcoin, you are looking at close to $4.5 billion. And it's just crazy, man. But to do your bigger point, is there any value in blockchains of technology? So I think initially it was like, hey, blockchains of technology. And to your point, people were exploring the technology and what's possible. And then they start getting to the finance part of it. And that's when everything went haywire. So I do feel like blockchain, Bitcoin, and those other coins out there and stable coins, I think there's probably no value now. We've proven that time and time again from FTX to Coinbase is having issues now um, because of the, there's the need for some kind of centralization to keep things stable. When you don't have anything, this decentralization of money, I don't think it's a myth, right? It, it doesn't exist. and so they're having to walk that back. So I think blockchain as a technology still has value, but just the, the crap that we've been sold for a couple of years about Bitcoin being a store of value or Ethereum could really do payments. It's just it's bearing out, right? I think right. how many people are out there showing off their crypto status, right? Or talking about it as much. People who had this has names, Twitter, Twitter names of Bitcoin Barry, right? I don't see Bitcoin Barry anymore. Exactly. And it's OpenSea, which was one of the big NFT backers. So the way their system works is they don't actually have, remember the big thing was about smart contracts yeah. and being able to say, hey, if you sell this thing again, then 5% or whatever percentage is going to go back to the owner. Recently, they just said, you know what? We want to keep more of the money. So we're not going to honor that part of the contract. And I said, wait a minute. I thought it was built into the contract. It's no, it's based on the platform. So the thing itself can say you're supposed to pay out that money, but it's not built into the technology that OpenSea has to actually adhere to that agreement. So they can say, yeah, sure. I don't care if you bought this from Sotheby's and you paid this much and the artist is supposed to get this much of a cut. We're changing our, po our policy. You're not going to get that much of a cut. And it, it's such a mess in all these areas of crypto and blockchain. I actually think it's actually related to like nuclear technology or any technology, basically. You have this technology of something like nuclear fission and you can create bombs with it or you can create power plants. People need the power plants. We have a couple of them out here by San Diego, but no one really wants to push nuclear because of all the bad connotations with it. So it's just very weird. And I, I hope blockchain actually gets itself together because I think there's an, it's a great idea, but 
yeah, it's just, yeah, I'm just reading about what you just said about the creator royalties and stuff like that, that they're stopping that open sea is and how everybody's up in a war about that. It's just, yeah, man, that was the vision of NFTs, be able to always pay the original the artist and all the person created it. Yeah. And now one of the bigger sites that pushes NFTs is saying, no, nah, we ain't going to give you royalty fees no more. August 31st has done. But yeah, man, it's definitely frustrating to see this happening and we're talking about, we talked about big a couple of years ago. Everybody was about it. What Bitcoin, blockchain and Bitcoin. Then we evolved that through the meta, uh, NFTs. Heck, Facebook doesn't even talk about it anymore. And they renamed their name Metaverse, right? Or Meta yeah. to, to phase in that. And so now the next thing is AI, right? And even that, to be honest with you, I'm seeing some blowback now, right? With your, your beloved Bing, I'm seeing is not getting as much market share as up there embeddedness of AI system. And also chat GPT is also dying down a little bit with the number of uses on it. So yeah, all these big technology woo-woos, it's just, you know, I go back to Adam Comover, Adam Comover, who we talked about on this pod. He said that AI was a hype machine, mismarketing, hypeness. And he related that to the metaverse, to Bitcoin. He says it's a long line of hustle plays by the tech business industry. He may not be wrong in this. <laughs> because it does seem a lot of it's just trying to drum up interest, market. We talked about this before the pie, right? Mm -hmm. They have folks who are selling things like bread, building brands off of selling sliced bread, which has been around since the 1500s. So yeah, nothing, nothing innovative, just, hey, bro, I got some bread. And this is what tech is doing, is well good at, right? Creating a marketing frenzy around technology that may or may not be valuable or worth it in our daily lives. So anyway, blockchain, Bitcoin, yeah, man. We'll see where it goes. Yeah, we shall see. Anything else, man? Because this whole blockchain thing, I'm just going down the rabbit hole again. Chat GPT. <laughs> Chat GPT. I'm reading this headline, Chat GPT's fate hangs in the balance as OpenAI reportedly as just closer to bankruptcy. It's like, I, I, I get it because when, anytime you have a, a bubble or a surge of activity, there's only going to be a few outliers that actually make it and then everybody else falls off. Like we're still seeing the end of that from the dot-com era where it was like there were thousands of dot-coms, but you only know about your Ebays, your yeah, not even, uh, Yahoo. You hear me messing up like that? Yeah. Nobody knows what Yahoo is. Google, Amazon. You know what I'm saying? You have a couple players that make it out and everybody else just dies off. So we're seeing that much faster where you have these bigger bubbles and more people falling off faster. I, well, I and then we, in each bubble, we learn more and more. So I think the issue with AI is, and we're seeing that with the Hollywood strikes, people are like, wait a minute. How's it learning? How's it getting so smart? It's taking my hard-earned information for free? Oh, hell no. And the writer's strike, that's one of the things they're talking about. That's one of the things uh, artists, the actors, right? The images and stuff, likeness. There needs to be some licensing of that. And so now if there's cost to get data, then of course, ChatGPT by not last long. Everyone's going to have struggle trying to get that data. So I think we're learning because we learned that lesson from Google, right? Google took a lot of our information. We learned a lesson from Facebook. So ChatGPT and other AI, generative AI systems, large language models, they're going to large language models. They're going to learn real quick that people are like, nah, you just ain't taking my scraping a website, taking my data, son, back going up. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, man, as we end this, man, yeah, man, been the, this week, uh, yeah, just preparing, getting ready for InvestFest, shout out, uh, earn your leisure and all those guys. So I'll let you know how that goes. I may report live from there. Maybe I'll do a live check-in. Yeah, <laughs> we'll let me know if you one. find these. Let me know if you find these scammers. Oh, yeah, hook, hook, hook me up on the IG live and something. We'll, we'll talk. Yeah, we'll do talk one. Yeah, we might do one IG live from Invest Fest. But that's about it. What about you? Oh man, I'm just about to blow out the biggest project I've done in this space for a while. So just, just watch for it. I love it. I love it, man. Mr. Benjamin, man, it's always a pleasure catching up, man. Hey, guys, look, if you like this podcast, please continue to subscribe and comment at Show Versus Business on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. We're doing YouTube shorts now, so check those out. 
listen to us at Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to podcasts. But go check out our website also, Sure Business. So, Mr. Benja, have a great one. Peace.